Today on the Dad the Best I Can show. So the book is indistractable. It's about how to control your attention and choose your life. And there's a big portion of the book that's dedicated to this question of how do you raise indistractable kids? Because I, I believe that becoming indistractable is really going to be the skill of the century. I mean, if you think the world is a distracting place today, just wait a few years, right? It's only going to become more potentially distracting. And so we really do have to equip our kids with the ability to control their attention and choose their life or somebody's going to control those things for them. Um, so, you know, I remember when my daughter was uh, was much younger, uh, some of her first words were iPad time, iPad time. I mean, she's not, <laughs> you know, and this is a, this is a struggle I know a lot of parents have. And as she's aged, you know, the struggle, the, 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 the challenges have changed with her, her age, different challenges have come up. Uh, but I think it's very important to, to take a, a rational perspective, a research back, as opposed to a fear-based approach to many of these technologies. And so that's a big reason why I wrote this book. I wanted to figure this out for myself, but I also wanted to offer some, some uh, uh, help for parents out there who may be struggling with this question of how much tech, which tech, is tech you know, terrible for them, is it good for them? A lot of questions out there, and unfortunately, a lot of misinformation. Welcome to the Dad the Best I Can show. My name is Rob Roseman, who wants to be a millionaire legend, Chicago futures trader, Vegas poker pro. Now I'm a dad to three kids, ages seven, five, and two. Phew. Where's me out just thinking about it? Each week, we bring on high-performing dads like you. Entrepreneurs like Jesse Itzler, CEOs like David Cancel from Drift.com, athletes like Ken Rideout, best-selling children's authors like Zach Bush, to tell us your stories, your dad tips and tricks, to help all of us make it through dad life. We have a brand new website over at dadthebestican.com. Go on over to dadthebestican.com and sign up with your email. It's 100% free, of course. Be the first to hear brand new dad guests and get weekly dad tips in your inbox. How else are you going to keep up with the roller coaster that is dad life? Okay, enough out of me. On to today's show. All right. Welcome to the Dad the Best I Can show. Today, we are lucky to be joined by Nir Eyal. Nir is a professor at Stanford's Graduate School of Business and the author of the best-selling book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. He writes an incredibly addictive blog at nearandfar.com. That's near, spelt N-I-R. And his podcast is in my top five most played list. Nir's brand new book is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. I can't think of a more important topic for parents today, for our kids, and for ourselves. Hey, Nir, how's it going today? Great. Thanks so much for having me here. My pleasure. Where are you calling in from? I am in New York City. The fall, fall is starting to hit, I hope. Uh, yeah, a little, it's warmer than expected, but yeah, not too bad. Yes, and I was reading you were born in Israel. We just celebrated Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. Shana Tova to you. Shana Tova, yeah, yeah. I was born in Israel, but left when I was three years old and uh, grew up in Orlando, Florida, or a suburb thereof. All right, so you are a dad. How old is your daughter now? She's 11 years old. 11, so I'm guessing a big reason you wrote this book was to prepare yourself for the coming teenage years. Well, you know, I, I, technology, so the book is indistractable. It's about how to control your attention and choose your life. And there's a big portion of the book that's dedicated to this question of how do you raise indistractable kids? Because I, I believe that becoming indistractable is really going to be the skill of the century. I mean, if you think the world is a distracting place today, just wait a few years, right? It's only going to become more potentially distracting. And so we really do have to equip our kids with the ability to control their attention and choose their life or somebody's going to control those things for them. Um, so, you know, I remember when my daughter was, uh, was much younger, uh, some of her first words were iPad time, iPad time. I mean, she was <laughs> constantly, you know, and this is, a, this is a struggle I know a lot of parents have. And as she's aged, you know, the struggle, the, 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 the challenges have changed with her, her age, different challenges have come up. Um, but I think it's very important to, to take a, a rational perspective, a research back as opposed to a fear based approach to many of these technologies. And so that's a big reason why I wrote this book. I wanted to figure this out for myself. But I also wanted to offer some some uh, uh, help for parents out there who may be struggling with this question of how much tech, which tech is tech, you know, terrible for them? Is it good for them? A lot of questions out there. And unfortunately, a lot of misinformation. 
Yeah, that's what I, I do want to hear you talk about, because I know, like a lot of people, I'm quickly, I'm quick to blame the tech, you know, it's this mm. phone, it's this Instagram, it's just hooking me. And I'm sure that is contributing to it. And it is more potent and concentrated than it used to be. But I think you have a different take on why we're so distracted today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, the, that you know, the, the book is really about root causes versus proximal causes, that clearly technology plays a role. Uh, and, and technology, let's, you know, let's not mince words here, it is designed to hook you. Uh, that was the title of my first book. And it, it, you know, I, I think that if you look at how these products are designed, they are absolutely designed to be very engaging. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, however. I mean, we want products to be user-friendly. We want products to be fun to use. I mean, are we going to say, hey, Netflix, stop making your shows so interesting because I want to watch them all the time? Or, <laughs> you know, Facebook, please make your product less user-friendly because, you know, I find myself scrolling too much. That's... Eh, not really what we want from our products. We want products to be engaging. We want them to, to be things that uh, uh, create these, these habits in our lives because they do us good. We like them. Now, it's, a, it's really a matter of how we use these things and making sure that we get the best of these technologies without letting them get the best of us. I, I'm not for this narrative that I think is um, propagated uh, you know, ironically by the media who makes money the same exact way that Facebook and YouTube and Google make money, which is by selling your attention. Uh, but of course, you know, old media has a, has a stake in the game, right? They they know that they are in competition with with new media uh, for your attention, and so they're fighting like hell to uh, to to show the bad side. And there is certainly a bad side. I, I don't think that that uh, tech companies are lily white. There's a lot that they could do better. A lot of questions. A lot of things need to improve. But I think when it comes specifically to this challenge of, you know, is technology addicting us? Is it hijacking our brains? Is it, uh, you know, are our children being manipulated by it? This is overblown. And it's, it's not only is it overblown, it's not scientifically accurate. And it's harmful because what it is leading to is learned helplessness. When we as parents say, oh, you know, there's nothing I can do. My kid is just addicted to Fortnite or whatever it might be. You know, the, the, the computer is hijacking their brain. We stop trying. We don't do anything about it. And so the, the, the story I like to recall in the book is the research around the sugar high. I mean, every parent out there, we all know what the sugar high is, right? Your kid goes to a birthday party and uh, eats a bunch of chocolate cake and then acts crazy, right? Wrong. Turns out there is no such thing as a sugar high. Look it up. Google it. Uh, there's been studies upon studies. There's actually been meta studies that have shown that there is no such thing as a sugar high except on parents. <laughs> that in fact, when they did a study and they gave kids a placebo, but they told the parents that the kid was given candy, the parents, not the child, acted crazy. <laughs> the parent followed around their kids. The parents said the kids rated the kids' behavior as, as more naughty. Uh, the parent was the one that was acting badly, not the child. There is no such thing as a sugar high, and yet we make it up in our heads because we as parents, let's face it, and as parents, I, you know, I get this, we want something to blame. Right? We want something that we can say, ah, it's not me, it's not my kid, it's that. Uh, right. And sometimes that is true. Most of the time, you know, if you look at the history of innovation, it's not true. Right? You know, before today, it's social media and, and smartphone apps and video games. Before that, it was, uh, you know, my generation, it was uh, Super Mario Brothers and television and heavy metal music and rap and comic books. I mean, all of these things in turn have been things that are supposedly melting kids' brains, and it, it never turns out to be the case. It's never the root cause of the problem. So do you think, though, that I was in the Super Mario generation, too, and that brings up an interesting thought that I have as, oh, the games in my days were a little slower. They weren't as, they were probably addicting. I'm sure my mom had to drag me off that thing. But the fact that everything is in our pocket now or that a kid can go hide in his room with his iPad, it does seem like it's a little bit more easily to be hooked or easily to be isolated and for kids to just fall into this this pattern that seems like it can be dangerous what are your th obviously the tech has improved and like you said there's tons of benefits that come from it so it's like how can we what are we're pretty good at admiring the problem i think a lot of people understand that this is something going on and we need to address it what kind of strategies as parents you know we're modeling this behavior for our kids so i guess let's start out with what can we do to be better at, at dealing with our tech 
Yeah, so I, I think to, to your first point, certainly, uh, you know, while distraction is not a new problem, I mean, Socrates and Aristotle talked about this problem 2,500 years ago. Literally, that you know, people 2,500 years ago were saying, oh, isn't the world such a distracting place these days? So this is, <laughs> this is clearly not a new problem. It's part of the human condition. But what I will tell you is that if it is distraction that you are looking for, then distraction you will find. Mm -hmm. That it is easier than ever. If that's what you're seeking out, of course you will find it because you know, we're carrying around these distractions with us in our pocket, right? So if you're, if you're looking for it, for sure you're gonna find it. The question is, why do we look for it? And that's, I think, what, what we really need to focus on both as parents and as individuals, you know, trying to manage our own distraction. Uh, we need to figure out what the root cause of the problem is. And so it turns out that the root, and let me just let me just back up a second. I want to define what I mean by distraction because you know distraction doesn't mean playing video games or watching TV or whatever. Distraction to understand what distraction is, you have to understand what the opposite of distraction is. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. Okay, the opposite of distraction is traction. Both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you, pull, things that you do with intent. The opposite of traction is distraction, anything you do that pulls you away from what you plan to do, things that you do not do with intent. So that means if what you want to do with your time it, or, or what your kid wants to do with their time is to play a video game or, you know, Play, uh, you know, scroll around Reddit or uh, uh, use social media, if that's what they plan to do with their time, or if what you plan to do with your time, I mean, don't tell me that, you know, a kid playing Fortnite is somehow morally inferior to us dads watching, you know, football for three hours. Mm -hmm. on, on uh, what, What's the difference? There is mm -hmm. no difference. I'd, in fact, I'd much rather have a kid play with friends, at least online, some kind of interactive technology than just watching the boob tube. So there is no moral uh, superiority here. Whatever it is you plan to do with your time, do it. Enjoy. There's nothing, un not, there's nothing unhealthy about it as long as it's done in the right amount of time. Uh, then, th then there's nothing unhealthy about it. In fact, studies have found that two hours or less of extracurricular screen time has no negative effects on kids. Where we start seeing negative effects on well-being is when the kid is, is too young, right? We, uh, you know, below age two, the, the American Pediatric Association says there's no need for screen times before age two. But where we start seeing, you know, a slight decrease in, in emotional well-being is really with excessive screen time, five, six, seven hours a day of screen time. That's where we start seeing some problems. And even then, it's who is using and what they're doing. And there's lots of other factors there as well. But I think this, this is very important to understand that anything that you want to do with your time, that you plan to do in ahead, ahead of time, is perfectly fine. That's traction. Anything that is not that is distraction. Uh, so that's that's the first thing we need to understand. So that means that if you don't plan your day, somebody else will. Mm -hmm. That most people out there, two thirds of Americans, don't keep any sort of a calendar. And this is this is basic stuff, right? I mean, there's thousands of studies have shown that this technique called making an implementation intention, which is just planning out what you're going to do and when you're going to do it, is among the most powerful techniques that we can use to to not get distracted. So that's that's kind of basic stuff. And I talk about a lot of other strategies and techniques you can use, but I think particularly when it comes to our kids and for ourselves, we have to ask ourselves this fundamental question of what leads us to distraction in the first place, right? If we know what we want to do, why don't we do it? If we know we should be fully present with our kids, why do we check our phone at the dinner table? You know, let me tell you if, you, if you're checking your phone while you're having dinner with your kids, as I used to do, the problem ain't your phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's something else going on. If you sit down at your desk and you say, okay, I'm going to work on that big project and you still find yourself procrastinating, checking emails, Slack channels, the news, whatever, and you can't get the motivation to do what it is you said you're going to do, I'm telling you, it's not the technology doing it to you. There's something else going on. What's going on? What's going on is what's called the internal triggers. People tend to think that distraction is all about the external triggers, the pings, the dings, the rings, and those definitely play a role. But what is a much more common source of distraction are the internal triggers. Internal triggers are these psychological states we seek to escape that we have to come to grips with the fact that all distraction, anytime we do something against our better interests like this, when we get distracted, we are doing it for one reason and one reason only, and that is to escape discomfort. We're using our devices like babies use pacifiers because we, want to we don't want to feel something, boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, stress, anxiety. We don't like to feel these things. And so what we are doing is training our brain 
to reach for something to relieve that emotional discomfort. And I don't care if it's Facebook, if it's email, if it's the bottle, all of these things are done to escape psychological discomfort. So that means that all the productivity tips in the world, you know, all the life hacks are not going to work unless we fundamentally deal with either fixing the source of the discomfort or learn healthier tactics to cope with it. So that has to be the first step, both for us and for our kids. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, this is like any moment of boredom, it seems like. I know I'm guilty of, and I'm sure most people, we're reaching for our phone, whether if it's that we're at dinner or we're even, I see people at the red light, we're all guilty of, oh, I got five seconds. So it does make it easier to find distraction now. So I think we're all kind of guilty of this. So what what are your strategies for, or what's an example that we can do to not have our have this impulse to check our phone at the dinner table. I mean, for us, we're learning it almost has to be off of us in another room and that really does solve it. So again, I think a lot of people are like, it almost feels like we can't help ourselves. Like there's this phantom limb that we're just reaching for, which again, we don't want to blame the tech, but we almost feel helpless to it or it almost seems harmless in some ways, but it does seem like it's insidious and, I'm telling my kid to enough with the iPad as I'm looking mm-hmm. at my phone. So I That's realize right. like I'm, yeah. I'm just as guilty of it. And, and look, kids are hypocrisy detection devices, <laughs> right? They will call you out, uh, you know, very quickly. If they see, what, see you doing something that you tell them not to do, they love that. <laughs> yeah. So the first step, of course, is to become indistractable ourselves. Uh, and I'm not telling you what your values should be. I want you to, ha- I want to help you live your life according to your values, whatever those values are. So if you value time with your family, I want to help you be fully present with your family. If you value your f- physical health, I want to help you make sure you do what you say you're going to do and go to the gym or do that big project at work or whatever it is that you say you want to do with your time. So I'm not telling you one thing is better to do with your time than something else. Whatever it is that you think you want to do with your time, that's what I want to help you do. And so there's a few steps that you can follow. The the four big strategies are number one, we have to master these internal triggers. We have to learn healthy ways to cope with discomfort because fundamentally time management is pain management. So we have to learn tactics to cope with that discomfort so that when we feel boredom, anxiety, fatigue, loneliness, stress, whatever it is that we're feeling, we don't automatically turn to our device. We use some other tactic to cope with that discomfort. And there's lots and lots of tactics that we can use there. The second big step is to make time for traction. And that means that we have to plan our day or someone else will. Because you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Mm. You know, I worked with a lot of people over the years and, you know, something that I see all the time is people who have empty calendars, you know, nothing planned. Well, if you have big old white space in your day, you know what you're going to do with your time. (laughs) Something is going to distract you. You're going to check email or Facebook or Instagram or the news or ESPN or your, your boss is going to want something or your kids are going to want something. All of these things can lead us to distraction if we don't define what we want to do with our time. And that means for our kids as well, right? One of the things I, I saw a lot of parents doing is that, you know, when the phone pings and dings them, that's, that's bad, right? But when the parent interrupts a kid, I've seen this, you know, all the time, you know, the kid's doing homework. And the parent says, Joey, what about baseball practice? When is that again? When is the, you know, we interrupt our kids. We can be distractions for our kids as well. So what we want to do is to plan their day so that we know after, you know, kids, it's easier to do because most of their day is at school. It's already scheduled. But after school, we want to make sure that we make time for the things that are important to them, to help them live out their values, which can include some time for games, right? It's perfectly fine if there's an hour of video games, an hour of, of, you know, age appropriate content online. That's okay, as long as we make time for it and we decide that's what we want to do. The third thing we can do is to hack back the external triggers. Uh, You know, these devices are made to hack our attention. That's how they're designed. But that doesn't mean we can't hack back. How do we do that? Well, we make sure that there is nothing that pings or dings in kids' rooms. And then that only includes you know, computers and cell phones, televisions, radios, anything that will interrupt their sleep has no place in their bedrooms. I cannot think of one good reason why a healthy child needs a television in their bedroom. I can't think of a good reason why a couple, right? Why we parents need television in the bedroom. It only leads to bad stuff, right? Leave that stuff in a communal space. Anything that could potentially interrupt sleep is not necessary. One of the tests for 
how we know, I get this question all the time of how do I know my kid is ready for technology? The answer is when they know how to turn it off. <laughs> do they know how to use the built-in settings when they're studying, when they're at the dinner table? You know, it's just like, what, uh, you know, swimming uh, is wonderful, but if a kid doesn't know how to swim, then a pool can be very, very dangerous. So you wouldn't let a kid swim in a pool without knowing how to swim. So why are we giving kids devices before we know they know how to use it and know how to turn them off at the appropriate times? So that's a little bit about the third step. And then the fourth step is to prevent distraction with packs. Now we can make these what's called a pre-commitment in various areas of our life to make sure that we don't do something we later regret, that we can block ourselves from these potential distractions throughout our day. Um, so those are the four basic steps. Master the internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back the external triggers, and prevent distractions with packs. Now I'm giving you the, the 30,000 foot uh, flyover, <laughs> but there's, there's a lot more there, of course. But that's the big four strategies. Yeah, we'll have to read the book and check out your blog too, because I know you write a ton about this and it's very easy to digest and relatable. And since you are a dad, you know, it's, it means a lot more knowing that you've got an 11 year old at home pushing back on some of these same things as my kids. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the most important things uh, that we need to understand when it comes to kids and tech is we don't want to dictate from on high that uh, if there's one advice I could give parents out there is to be vulnerable with your kids to let them know that you're struggling with this stuff as well. You know, many times we parents, we want to project that we know everything and we don't struggle and every, you know, we, we've got everything under control. We have our shit together all the time. And that's not true. Mm -hmm. You know, tell them that, yeah, you struggle with this stuff too, but let's see, we can do this together. And here's what I'm doing to become indistractable. And here's how I can, you know, show you some tactics that you can use as well. Because we, we can't be hypocrites. We have to display, we have to show them uh, how to do this stuff. And so what this leads to is a conversation as opposed to a conflict. So when my daughter was five years old, uh, she was you know, too, spending way too much time on the iPad. And so we had a little conversation. We said, look, I, we asked her, we said, you know, what, the cost of using too much tech, too much screen time is not that it's melting your brain. You don't need to vilify technology and make up some stories. Uh, what, what, you, what we want to tell them is that, look, the cost of using tech so much is all the other stuff you could do with your time right? It's playing with your friends outside. It's reading a book or, or playing with mommy and daddy, going to the pool, going to the park. That's the cost of, of this tech use. So we asked her at five years old, how much time do you want with your iPad? And she thought she was getting a deal. She said, she said two episodes, mm -hmm. two episodes on Netflix of age appropriate content is about 45 minutes. 45 minutes is fine. There's no studies that show there's any deleterious effects to age appropriate contact, uh, content for 45 minutes a day. So we said, okay, fine, but you're responsible for making sure that you only watch the 45 minutes. How will you make sure that you don't go overboard? And so she thought for a minute and we used to have this microwave that was, uh, that was below the counter. And she realized that she could you know, program that microwave for 45 minutes and then it would beep at her and tell her, okay, now, now that's, that's all the time you have. Today, she actually uses Amazon Alexa. She'll say, Alexa, set the timer for 45 minutes, or she'll use Apple screen time. It's built right into the device. So the reason this is so great, I'm not the bad guy anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not me screaming at her. It's a tool that she set for herself that tells her that her time's up. And so she's gained a skill that's going to be helpful for her well after she leaves the household. That's great. And you're empowering her versus lecturing and, like you said, being the bad guy. Exactly. Because, you know, if you, if you lecture and impose these strict rules, you know what's going to happen. When they leave the house or when you're not around, yeah. <laughs> they're going to do whatever they want. So exactly. we're, we're almost incentivizing cheating. And we don't want to do that. We want to empower them. Let's take a quick break for our dad tip of the week brought to you by Kickstart Reading. Do you have kids between the ages of three and six? I've got two boys, and when my older son was going into kindergarten, my wife and I quickly learned that we had no idea how to teach him how to read. We found Kickstart Reading and watched one two-minute video together, and you could see his confidence take off. Bonus, I felt like dad of the year. Here's another dad talking about how Kickstart Reading is helping his boys learn how to read. Hey there, this is Chris Heller, and I'm a big fan of Kickstart Reading. Each morning before school, I show a video to my four-and-a-half-year-old son, and now his little two-year-old brother is getting in on the action as well. I'm a big fan of the videos. Highly consumable and engaging for young boys. Definite recommend for all parents out there who are looking to get their kids off to the right start with reading. Kickstart Reading. Go to kickstartreading.com and use the code DAD to get 65% off right now. 
That's D-A-D, dad. See, it works. Kickstartreading.com. Now back to the show. And here on the Dad the Best I Can show, we like to do a dad tip. You've given us a lot here. Do you have a, another tip for other dads out there? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that, that I learned in the process of writing this book is the importance of self-compassion. That I know a lot of dads are like me in that we beat ourselves up all the time. We're our own worst critics. Uh, we tell ourselves how we failed and we didn't do this right. And, you know, maybe we're not cut out for this stuff. And I used to have this dialogue all the time. And it's not helpful. And so if there's, if there's one skill I think we dads need to learn is, is self-compassion. In fact, the research shows that people who are more self-compassionate are more likely to reach their long-term goals. And the way to do this, the way to become self-compassionate, a good rule of thumb is to only talk to yourself the way you would talk to a good buddy, right? So, you know, when, when a buddy messes up, uh, maybe they check their phone while they were with their kid, like I used to do all the time. We wouldn't say, oh my God, you jerk, you're a horrible human being, right? You, you would say, okay, wow, that sounds like you're struggling with that, you know? So we want to start talking to ourselves the way we would talk to a good friend. Um, and, and I think that cultivating self-compassion is, is a very, very important skill because it actually does help us get better over time as long as we are kind to ourselves. That's great. And we need to, that, that reminder, almost, we almost need that daily. So a very good tip. And we had a question. Would you take one question from one of sure. our listeners? Absolutely. This one comes from Dan Whalen on Instagram. He says, as a working dad, there are so many things on my plate. Our phones connect us to all these commitments. Mm -hmm. making them easier to access, but force us to multitask and split our attention. My question is, how does Nia remove things from his plate? What do his priorities look like? And how does that help him be a better dad? Yeah, so I think that the tool that will change your life, if this is something you struggle with, is to use a schedule maker tool. Uh, I, I, I used to use Google Calendar and people told me it was too complicated. And uh, so I actually built my own tool. I'll give you a link to the uh, show notes uh, for, the, for this tool. The idea here is that we want to take our average week and we want to schedule our entire week. And I'm talking about time for the shower, time for lunch, time to meal prep, time to do all the things you have to do. I want you to put those on your calendar. This entire exercise, it sounds like it's onerous. It's like about maybe 30, 45 minutes to do the first time. And what you're doing when you do this, you're giving yourself the gift of knowing what is traction and what is distraction for every minute of the day. Because now you can look at your calendar and if something pops up and demands your attention, you can look at that calendar and say, okay, is this what I plan to do? Therefore, it is traction or is it a distraction? Now, it doesn't mean that if an emergency come up, comes up, you won't handle it right? But what it does mean is that now for the first time, you can do something about the distractions that keep coming up. You know, there's that, there's that saying that the uh, definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. How many of us get distracted by the same thing day after day after day, and we don't fix the problem? Because there's only three sources of distraction, an internal trigger, an external trigger, or a planning problem. And so by looking at our calendars and understanding, okay, I got distracted here because of that and this, we can start doing something about it. Becoming indistractable is about this iterative process to help us make sure we can live with personal integrity. And that, that means we've got to start planning out our day in advance so we can tell the difference between traction and distraction. That's really good. Uh, a lot of our guests on the show have said the same thing. I know Jesse Itzler walks around with a giant calendar. He's got his whole year planned out and this must <laughs> be the reason. He's like, I know what I have to do. And if I yeah. don't, trouble it's, awaits. So. It's imperative. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. All right, Nir. Thank you so much for being on the Dad the Best I Can podcast. Uh, where can people learn more about what you're up to? Absolutely. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. So my website is Nir and Far. Nir spelled like my first name, N-I-R. And my book is called Indistractable. And you can learn more. There's a, a free video course, a complimentary workbook at indistractable.com. Yeah, it's excellent stuff. I highly recommend everybody check it out. Your podcast is great too. They're short and they're fun and I'm always learning something. So another, another good recommendation. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Nir. Have a great day. All right, Rob. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for listening to the Dad the Best I Can show. Go take five seconds, hop on over to dadthebestican.com and sign up with your email to get weekly updates, dad tips in your mailbox, get your questions answered on the show. That's dadthebestican.com. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and leave us a five-star rating on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Actually, five stars. We could do better than that. Brooks. 
Infinity stars, Cameron. How many stars? Infinity thousand. Infinity thousand. You gotta one up him in this household. Thanks. See ya.